calling all authors. Unleash your creativity and join Wild Ink Publishing's literary movement. We are seeking poetry, personal essays, and short stories for Uncensored Ink, a banned book-inspired anthology. This is your chance to illuminate the shadows of censorship, challenge the norms, and be a part of a collection that celebrates the power of expression. Submissions open in October during Banned Book Month. For more information, visit www.wild-inc-publishing.com. Thank you for joining us in our fight for intellectual freedom. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is Burn This Book, a banned books book club where we, Nicole and Eden, read a banned or challenged book twice a month and discuss its meaning, impact, and censorship to make it more accessible for all readers. We'll be talking today with Kristen Oda about her experience as a high school teacher in Utah. And we're talking about the book To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, which was published in 1960. A little bit about Kristen really quick. She was named Educator of the Year at Copper Hills High School in in, in Salt Lake. Is that in Salt Lake? Uh, It's in West Jordan. Okay. But Salt Lake Somewhere. Yeah, basically Salt Lake. But yeah, to me, it's Salt Lake. It's not (laughs) Salt Lake. Believe me, it's not. (laughs) It is far out west. Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, go oh ahead. no, you, you leave oh. this. You leave this, Eden. Go ahead. Well, well I invited Kristen here because uh, you posted something really compelling on Instagram. Uh, and that was you talking about getting educator of the year for the high school year te- you were teaching at and then quitting at the end of the school year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, walk us through that. Um, okay, so I taught for seven years. Um, and all those seven years were in Utah. The first two years I taught at Payson High School, which is very far south in uh, Utah County. And then I um, transferred to Copper Hills High School, which is in West Jordan, um, which is in Salt Lake County. And yeah, I was just doing my teaching thing and I, I really liked it. I was an English teacher. I did all different levels. I, I taught a lot of sophomores, the regular classes and the honors. And then I also, once I got my master's, I was able to teach concurrent classes. So like intro to writing classes through Slick for like the seniors and stuff. So yeah, I was doing that. I didn't ever think I'd be in the classroom for 30 years. Um, But I had thought like, oh, maybe I'll eventually get my PhD and like go on to like the university level, but like within education. But then it was about, I don't know, it was around... Uh, January of 2023 where suddenly I'm just like I don't know if I can do this anymore also side note I didn't have my Adderall at that point because there was a shortage (laughs) and so (laughs) it's like okay I can't make any life decisions when I don't have my medication you know so I get it back after a while and then like I'm starting to feel normal again but I'm like I still feel like I don't think I want to come back next school year and I, I like that video you mentioned um one of the main things I had realized was like okay I've known I'm a good teacher and like it is good to get like that affirmation from people and be recognized for like your hard work and whatever but ultimately as a teacher I got teacher of the year did I get a raise no <laughs> actually I got $500 which is great but like if you got a raise that would be an extra $500 a month you know yeah, um yeah. They're very good about being like, we appreciate you. You're great. Like give you recognition. But like in the professional world, that's about it. When I'm like, if I was at a different company and I was the best employee out of a hundred plus employees, like, don't you think I'd be getting more than just like Mm -hmm. balloons and stuff, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, like it was nice, but I'm like, this is just another example of why education is a tough place to be. (laughs) It's very a uh, great British baking show where you give up so much time of your life, so much stress, and then all you get is a little, little cake stand. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Maybe it's some more followers on Instagram, but you don't even have to win for that. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, exactly. how many hours were you like putting into your job a week? Do you think like, and how many clubs were you part of? Because from what I saw yeah. on Instagram, you'd also had like. You were teaching a wide range of of students, and like it seemed like you were putting everything you could 
into these classes. Like it really felt like if I had, yeah. had a teacher like you, it would have been pretty life changing for me as a student. Just like how your think, kids yeah. that were means very I just portray like they seem well like they love Instagram. you. <laughs> <laughs> they, I overall yes I did have a good relationship with my students um I did want to make sure that I'm like I'm not going to be that teacher that burns out you know and so I was like pretty proud of myself once I made it to year five because like what 50% of teachers don't make it that long mm -hmm. and I'm like yay but also if you're teaching high school then that's when you could like be a coach or you could be an advisor for a club or all these different things there's just a lot more opportunity to like get to know your students but also like work more <laughs> and uh -huh. so um the biggest club that took my time was the latinos in action class and club um and i loved it and it was something that like gave meaning to my job because like i'd have these kids like for three years straight and they like um were awesome and I could see them grow up and I learned about their culture because I'm not Latina myself um for those of you who can't see me um <laughs> but so it was like it added a lot of meaning to my job but it was also a lot of time and so like whenever they had socials like that was my Friday night you know and I'd probably be the only adult there with like 50 kids being kids you know um and so I would just, it would be like eight o'clock. I'm like, guys, can we please like, can we finish <laughs> up? They're like, why? This is fun. I'm like, for you, <laughs> I want to go home. Like I've been here since 7 a.m. Like, so I would yeah. have those days where it's like 13 hours at the school where I'm like, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> and when I was a newer teacher, I'm like, look at me. Like I'm doing these things and kids appreciate me and I feel fulfilled. But after a few years, I'm like, I got to the point where I'm like, I know I'm a good teacher and I know they like me and I like them too, but I just don't care as much as I used to. And maybe it's because I need, I'm like the type of person that needs to be told like, great job. And then once I know that I'm doing a good job, I'm like, okay, I'm done working hard. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't, I'm done like going above and beyond because I know I can. And I notice I know people appreciated me. So now I'm just going to not. So I don't know. I think that's, I just kind of got to the point where I'm like, I just don't care as much as I used to. And yeah. I didn't want to get to that point. I didn't want to get to the point where then I was angry. Another thing, my students were good, but the, the trends I was seeing within our school and the district and just the country, I'm like, I don't want to be the change. I'm too tired. Can and you explain I can't. what you mean by that? Like what trend? So there's a lot of things and I had a lot of things that were great about my job. Other teachers might not have and other things that are bad about mine, they might not deal with so like yeah a lot of teachers will be like i spend my my personal money on like classroom supplies i've never done that like they we had a pretty good budget and like anything in my classroom unless it was like personal stuff like i didn't pay for and i don't have to worry about that so like when teachers will talk about that stuff i'm like i can't relate and so in some ways i'm lucky um but i guess what was happening i mean the biggest change was the pandemic we made a lot of exceptions for kids because obviously school was not the priority. Um, they were like online. So like what to 2020 March, 2020, they went online and no classes were live. It was just like on canvas, which is like, they knew how to use it. Um, but it was basically like load your lessons on there and they just do it on their own. And it was not good and it was very boring. And so our principal was like, be lenient and let them turn in whatever they need at the very, up to the very end, you know, like let's just pass them basically. Um, so, the, and I understood that cause I'm like, really like what's strange. What is the point yeah. of these assignments right now? They're not learning anything. So then we get back in person, but we're still pretty lenient with things like attendance and tardies. Um, and it just like, I feel like we just never got back to like the, um, the rules that we once had. Um, 
And so the kids just seem to get a little wilder and wilder. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I know it's a lot harder for elementary school teachers because they're like, these kids never learned how to sit in a chair. And so for us, I'm like, these kids, the last time they were in a school setting, like they were eighth graders. So like they learned. It just has to be reminded. So I feel like high school teachers didn't have to deal with a lot of reteaching just how to be a student like the elementary and junior high. Um, but we did have to like teach them of like, you're in high school, you have to get shit done. So, um, it was kind of like that. I actually lucked out things inside my classroom are okay. And we like, for the most part, I felt like my students respected me and like did what they were supposed to do. And they weren't like rude or anything like that. But like the second I would walk out of my classroom, I'd just be like, okay here we go like I'm gonna go to the bathroom now and who am I gonna catch in there doing things they're not supposed to and are they gonna first of all I look very young and so it'd be a lot of times they might think I'm an actual student and so if I go in there and I have to be a teacher they'll be like well who the hell are you and I'd be like teacher (laughs) stop vaping you know like I just want to go to the bathroom as a normal adult but I can't even do that you know or like oh I need to get some papers from the office well now I have to walk to the office and who am I going to see and who am I going to tell, like, go to class, you know, like, it was just getting so old where I'm like, I am always, like, on guard of, like, what's going to happen. And I hate that mentality of, like, let's catch kids being bad because that's, like, the second you think they're being bad, then you're going to, you know, then they are bad. And I was just getting to the point where I'm like, I'm turning into an angry, grumpy teacher and I do not want to be that person. And so one, it was kind of like, ah, we don't have an attendance policy and I don't see it happening anytime soon. And I'm kind of just done. And I don't want to be that teacher that complains a lot because teachers do complain a lot. And I try not to be like part of that, but I also don't want to be like toxic and super positive, but I'm like, okay, I did what I could. I changed my bathroom policy. I did all these things. And now if I just keep complaining, but nothing's changing, then I'm out. So for me, it might've been different than other teachers. Other teachers like the kids are just so bad or whatever. I'm like, for me, it's the fact that we don't have um, rules for these kids and like, there's no consequences. And so of course they're going to be bad because nothing happens. They get a slap on the wrist if, if that even happens. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Like they need, they need a structure. (laughs) Yeah. And if I'm saying that, because, like, people would call me, like, the chill teacher. But, like, if I'm saying that, then there is a real problem. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that parents would be okay if you did bring in structure? Like, do you think that the parents of your students would have been, like, fine with it? Or do you think there would have been pushback? Um, it's weird because that's another thing is, like, it feels like parents are not on our side whatsoever. And one of the things was, like, if we got a attendance policy, a lot of parents had a problem with it. I'm like, why would you have a problem with your kid going to class on time? You know, like, but they just like, I don't know. They just really advocate for their kid in a way where I'm like, you're making them like not independent and reliable. So then the kids realize, oh, this is fake. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah there are no real sh- consequences. Something I've noticed, and I don't know, like, I taught high school for one year. And it was so mm-hmm. hard. But I noticed that the biggest trial to getting, having my students have accountability was their parents. Like, they would, like, fight any so, sort of accountability. And it was like, I'm not saying your kid's a bad kid. I'm just yeah. saying that if they break this rule, then, you know, like, I'm not going to pass this kid. I've never seen him in class all semester. Yeah. <laughs> He's not going to pass. Mm-hmm. But, like, it was, like, the even the administration, but mostly the parents were, like, no, he deserves, like, it was really odd. And I don't know if it was, and maybe you can speak to this, but I don't know if it was fallout from COVID or if it's a new generation of parents having kids in high school who mm-hmm. don't see the value or if there is a lot of just, like, bad faith in public servants as well. Because I was mm-hmm. even, like, so my, my big chat that I had was with a person who I love dearly. Um, I think he's wonderful, but we had this long conversation about like librarians and cause he was like all upset that they were banning that they, that I was upset about book banning. Cause he was like, well, librarians can't really be trusted essentially. And neither can teachers cause they're just handing, you know, like the essential mm-hmm. argument was that like 
teachers and librarians are making pornography accessible for children. <laughs> and I was like, I, and so I, <laughs> so that was like, and I, I tried to be like, well, you were a child like 15 years ago. Were people just pushing porn on you? Like, were these adults in these jobs doing that? Like, cause things haven't changed. They still have the same job, but like, there's just this interesting distrust that I like, I don't know if you experienced that or if that has to do with COVID. I don't know, but it was a really strange conversation and like there was just nowhere to go because there was that inherent distress. So I was like, go talk to a teacher about this yeah. or go talk to a librarian. I think, yeah, books have always existed. English teachers have always existed in librarians. You know, I think it really is just like the political debate. You know, it's something that gets parents mad and so they use it as this like leverage. Um, but it's like, okay, if we're going to talk about people providing porn, did you buy your kid a phone? Because <laughs> that is much more dangerous than any book. You know, yeah. it's just like these things, ex- things exist regardless of what we do. Yeah. But like a book <laughs> is not going to do yeah. nearly as much damage in any way as that phone that you most likely gave yeah. your kid. Yeah, you know, yeah. and even if they were to read a book that was somewhat pornographic, that is how many hours of their life when they spend hours of their life on their phones. And I'm not saying they're watching porn the whole time, but yeah. like, it's just like you're, if that's your logic, then you better be getting rid of any other form or any device or anything in their life that could potentially be pornographic. And so if you're not willing to do the other parts and put blocks on their phone and all these other things, don't talk about books because your kid's not reading a book anyway. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, That's exactly... Uh-huh. It's just like, it just it boggles my mind where I'm like, okay, and also <laughs> they think we have this agenda. And honestly, my agenda is to be like, I would love for your kid to think for himself. That would be amazing. Um, and if they disagree with what I believe, that's fine too. <laughs> like, I really just want them to like have the ability to do research on their own and not just follow what everyone else is thinking. Although as an English teacher, I was super careful because I could easily have a target on my back. Like I'm ex-Mormon, um, I'm a lesbian. Um, and it was very, like, I never told my beliefs to my students. Like I would go out of my way to never state my beliefs and that we're not supposed to as teachers. Right. Mm -hmm. But by merely existing, they can make assumptions about what I think that are probably going to be spot on, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And so like, I had to be super careful to be like, okay, they probably think this about me. They're probably correct, but nothing about what I'm saying or doing is going to make them think that. They're just going to look at me and be like, she has short hair. She's a lesbian, you know? Like, so she probably thinks this, but it's like, that's not, that's not, I'm existing. So that's not against the rules. Um, so, but yeah, I was super careful to always be like, okay, imagine like a really conservative parent is in here. Um, like what should I say so that they wouldn't be mad? And that's like really how I taught. And it was weird because I started teaching at Payson. So like, for those of you who are not familiar with Payson, it is like the, the, the student demographic is like, um, like middle class, lower middle class. Um, a good amount is LDS. A good amount of like the white people are pretty poor. There's a drug problem. About 20% is Latino. We've got like farm kids and they have a rodeo club. They are for real. Like they're not just wearing the boots. Like they are actually living on like farms and all that stuff. So when I was teaching there, um, Trump got elected while I was there. It didn't have that same feeling that eventually came with, with Trump and all that stuff. Um, regardless of like how you think of him, like he didn't have the hold on his political party as he does now. So at that point, it didn't seem like a big deal. And then it was, and it was fine. They eventually found out I was gay and it was like, whoa, Miss Oda's gay. And then they got over it. Right. And then I went to a different (laughs) school and I was out from the moment I was there and it wasn't a big deal. Um, but it's strange because some of the books, like I taught a book, it was called death coming up the hill. It took place during the Vietnam War, and it's written by Chris Crow, who is a BYU professor. And it definitely takes the side of, like, Vietnam War, bad, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Um, 
But it was written by this BYU professor who actually was just like awarded professor of the year at BYU like a couple of years ago. Like he's very well respected and all that. But I was teaching it then a few years later now at Copper Hills where it was not the demographic like at Payson. And I was getting to the point where I'm like, ooh, I think some of these parents would not be happy with this book. And I had not been thinking like that years prior with the demographic that definitely might have a problem. You know, it was definitely giving more like liberal thoughts. It wasn't, you know, and it was taking place during the Vietnam War. So it's not like what's going on now. But I was like, I feel a little bit concerned that a student might say something to their parent and they'll get mad. And that was just wild to me because I'm like, this was a book written by a BYU professor. Yeah. And it's gotten to the mm-hmm. point where I can't say anything about any topic that is somewhat divided that even this book is making me feel like a little uncertain. And yeah. that was just like, wow, I have to be on my guard all the time because I don't want any mad parents you know yeah and I actually did avoid that um but I was that's also because I was like super paranoid yeah yeah Mm. that sucks that does suck (laughs) especially because we all know like I I would say that both sides can uh, probably have been able to acknowledge in the past that the Vietnam War is messy Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know there wasn't like yeah it was messy we didn't win um Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the Pentagon Papers weren't a great reflection of things but like um it, that's so fascinating that's a really good example of that kind of paranoia that should well and that and that was yeah. something that was in the past right it yeah. was getting to the point where i could we could i didn't feel comfortable even saying racism bad you know not because the kids oh. are like not because they didn't agree with me but because like we should not be bringing up that stuff and you know before you could just be like um yeah, slavery is really bad and racism is bad and we're still dealing with that and that's bad. And like, I felt like I couldn't even say that because that would just like, people be like, um, what are you trying to tell my kids? You know, like I felt like I couldn't even say that anymore. I'm like, that, no. you know? Oof. And like, I'm sure it would have been fine. But like I said, I'm like, I do not want a target on my back. Um, yeah. The last thing I want is an angry parent. So yeah. I just avoided those conversations. <laughs> You know, which is sad because it's an English class. Yeah. Like, how did you teach uh, To Kill a Mockingbird then? Um, To Kill a... Okay, so (laughs) To Kill a Mockingbird was actually summer reading. Um, Okay. And so we didn't spend much time in the class talking about it. Um, (laughs) Just just assign all the hard books for summer reading. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, and I'm like, if there's an N-word, I'm like, and we're reading Latin, I'm like, what do we do? Like, so I never taught a book that said, like, the N-word, that had it written um because I'm like I don't even know what to do in that situation so yeah they read it on their own um and so and what makes that one easier is like that was a long time ago so it's just like we're commenting on the past you know obviously we could make connections to now but that's that's like where I'd be careful of like how do we see racism now how do we see these things like that would make me feel a little worried um whoa yeah Because, like, now we're getting to the point where it's, like, people are banning books because they don't want kids to feel guilty for slavery in the past and all that stuff. So I'm like, well, would that make them feel guilty? (laughs) Like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Which is dumb because, like, it's okay to not feel happy all the time. Um, But, yeah, so for To Kill a Mockingbird, it was summer reading. Um, Also, people tend to like that book. Like, even, like, the really Mm -hmm. religious, conservative parents – um, they're like, they read it and they liked it when they were younger because it is an easy thing of like, they're a bad person and Atticus was a good person and saved yeah. them, you know? Um, so I think actually the conservative parents are the ones that are usually most okay with To Kill a Mockingbird. It's the more like liberal people where they're like, well, should we teach this anymore? Cause like they're making Atticus kind of like this white savior and like yeah. you're making mm-hmm. black people not seem as intelligent as they are, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's actually mm-hmm. interesting because a lot of reasons why it's getting banned now are more like from liberal views. Um, and so I think yeah. that's actually an interesting book to talk about when it comes to banning because it's not because they're like, it makes them feel bad about racism. That one I never had problems with because a lot of parents would be like, I loved that book. I'm like, great. We're going to talk about it for one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. see like a, a, 
a theme here among the parents. Um, the fact that they were up in arms about in- enacting an attendance policy at your school mm-hmm. and them wanting to protect, not, not specifically your body of parents, yeah. but parents in general who are ba- pushing for book bans mm-hmm. are trying to... Pr- quote unquote, protect their children from what they see as like a threat to them, yeah. whether mm-hmm. like attendance is, oh no, that's going to force my kid to wake up early. I don't know. What, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the, the, the bad consequence of having an attendance policy would be, but, mm-hmm. um, versus like, yeah, it feels like something they can control, which is yeah. ironic because they can control whether or not their child has a phone. Mm-hmm. I think I've mentioned it on the podcast before. But, like, my first exposure to pornography was from a kid, from a kid, from another kid, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like, yeah. no no librarian, most of whom have master's degrees, will go <laughs> out of their way to be like, hey, come here, little kid. Come behind my shelves and yeah. look at this. Well, it yeah. also asks the question, what is the role of a teacher? Is the role of a teacher to indoctrinate a certain idea or belief system? Or is the role of a teacher to just get someone prepared for college or for whatever trade they're getting to? Or is it to learn how to critically think? And Mm -hmm. like, so I think those are the questions. And I think we have a fundamental misunderstanding in society about Mm -hmm. what the role of these teachers are and what the role of librarians are. Like, Mm -hmm. I tried to ask the person I was talking to, like, well, I think the role of librarian is not to give you your kid books that your kid wants to read, the role of librarian is to to keep books accessible whether your kid wants to read them or not. That's why Mein Kampf is still in libraries. Um, they're not pushing it on anybody, but they're just keeping information. They're keeping that peaceful exchange of information is what the um, uh, American Library Association said. Nice. And I think teachers are the same way. Like, I don't think that your job is to tell me that Vietnam was wrong. I think your job is to help me understand that Vietnam was complicated and that there's a lot of sides to these issues and to help me figure Mm -hmm. out what I actually think. Like, I don't know. And I just think a lot of teachers genuinely do not think that's what education is. I think they really think it Mm -hmm. is a... A, malleable, a place where people are like just molding children's minds into oh, wait, whatever you think political parents party. Parents think that. Say that again. Were you sure? Is did you say teachers are trying to manipulate the kids, or you think parents think? I that? think parents think that. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> no, Kristen. Actually, I'm pretty sure <laughs> a good teacher is a witch. Uh, no, but like the, the thing that gets me is like when you were a kid, though. Did you even do the reading? These people who are like so involved. In these questions, mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, they didn't. Like, and and they, they're expecting their kid to, like, really deeply read the book. I read all yeah. the books, but I was a nerd. So, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. All the books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but like, also, we had English teachers to walk us through it. Uh, yeah. And we're not, like, left flailing on our own. Yeah. Yeah. These were also books I had never, yeah. Well, okay, here's, for example, like, I grew up very conservative. And at that point, I did have very conservative opinions and beliefs. And I knew that teachers tended to be more liberal. And I knew especially my English teachers were most likely Democrats when I did not identify as that at all. And my parents didn't and don't still. Um, But even with that knowledge, like... I respected them. I really liked them. And I remember like my teacher even saying like, oh, I hate Ayn Rand. Like, you know, and because I had read like The Fountainhead or something for my individual project. She even told me straight out like she didn't like it. And I was just like, okay, well, I'm still going to read it. You know, like I wasn't worried. I'm like, I knew that she had different opinions than me, but I was like totally fine with that. Like it didn't bother me. And I didn't feel like she was pushing anything on me, even though I knew her beliefs and she was very outspoken about her beliefs. And I'm like that, like, it's okay to know people have different opinions and it's Mm -hmm. fine. And I don't know. Also, because I grew up like that, I do know how a lot of parents think. And, like, my mom was one of those parents who was, like, didn't like a lot of the books that we read in school. She actually, like, didn't... We were reading um, uh, Night, the Mm -hmm. one about the... 
Holocaust. Yeah, the Holocaust and being in the internment camps. Oh, not internment camps. Oh, the concentration death camps. Concentration, concentration camps, right? Um, and my mom just like, she's just like, it's just a really intense book. And so she asked my teacher if I could read the version that was translated by the author's wife. And apparently it was a little less like graphic maybe. Um, and so like, I was super embarrassed and like, oh my gosh, mom, it's not that big of a deal. But like, she's an example of someone who's like, I will, I have a solution and I'm going to ask, I'm not going to make a big deal and be yeah. like, none of these kids can read this book. Cause I have a problem with it. My daughter even is still going to read it. And I'm asking that we can do this and it didn't have to be a big deal. And it was fine. Even like, she didn't even let my older sister take AP lit. Like I even, I took it, but like at that point, she didn't even want my older sister taking it. Cause she's like, it's just the, the content is just too much. And so my mom did have very strong and strict beliefs, yeah. but like she wasn't trying to tear down other things. Like I feel like a lot of these parents these days are like, what are you contributing? All you're doing is destroying. You're not like providing a solution. You just like have all these problems, even though you've never stepped in a classroom. And to be fair to parents, most of these people who are banning or fighting for books, they're like one person. It's yeah. like one person mm-hmm. in the district is causing all of this, all these problems. Like this yeah. one parent, she was trying to get some books taken from the library at Copper Hills High School. Her kid wasn't even in high school yet. And so they had to come up with a new rule of like, um, if you have a problem with a book, your kid has to be at that school, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's just like, that was ridiculous, but also most parents, even if they do have a problem, they're not causing a problem. It's like, a handful and yeah. they have so much power though it's crazy it's like really like they there's not that many parents that are like out there but there's enough to cause problems and they they're really changing th- it's like kind of scary how much power they have even though they don't mm-hmm. have the numbers because yeah. most people are pretty cons- not conservative they're pretty like middle understanding the, they're yeah. somewhat in the middle they're like yeah. i don't like this but i'm not gonna cause like all these problems but then there's like a couple and they do <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's kind of what we found Eden and i there was like 11 people across the whole country where like some school districts didn't have rules and so like mm-hmm. they didn't have kids in these high schools they would just submit Blanket submit to all the schools, mm-hmm. um, like, requests to ban books from the, yeah. the school libraries. Yeah, they're responsible that, for, And like, that's so nuts. Uh, the majority of book banning. I'm going to find the, the percentage. Because, yeah, it's not all parents, but there is, like, no. I do think the way we talk about it is crazy. I mean, granted, there have been over 1,400 uh, book bannings just this year. And mm. um, summer was half of, was already... <laughs> You know, like, we've just started the school yeah. year. We only had winter uh, semester. So, like, we're, we haven't even done a full school year. And we've already yeah. had almost 1,500 book bannings. Um, new, unique book bannings. And so, uh, that's crazy. I, I'm trying mm-hmm. not to say that anymore. That's wild. Um, but, mm-hmm. but, yeah, Eden had found this statistic. And it was, like, 11 parents were responsible or 11 individuals responsible for yeah. like over 40 percent of all of these i'm gonna find it though talk and about it's just yourselves. like but well, what are you doing yeah, you know and, it's just like you're not yeah. helping anything like are you making the kids education better no <laughs> mm-hmm. that did not maybe you spared some from some information or some things that might not be super appropriate but once again if you're worried about your kids safety the books are not the problem they will yeah. find inappropriate things if they want to find it. And the thing is, for most books, if there is inappropriate, inappropriate with quotation marks, uh, content around it, a lot of times it's just because it's too old for them, so they just won't fully understand the meaning or whatever the nuance and yeah. stuff. Or, like, it's just... It's, it's like, not actually, like, pornographic. It's, like, if you don't understand the book, you totally miss the point, you know? It's not yeah. just there for that reason. And mm-hmm. so it's just, yeah, it's just, like, why you, you – your enemy is the wrong thing. And you're yeah. wasting so <laughs> much energy. Like, books so already true. are so unpopular with kids. Like, why are you going to make this even worse? <laughs> uh, I guess banning books does make them more popular, though, but <laughs> – 
sure. I did find it. It was 11 people were responsible for over 60% of book challenges in the 21-22 school year. That's like wow. wild, 60%. And I was thinking about To Kill a Mockingbird because To Kill a Mockingbird, we're not going to go into like the plot because we feel like it's required reading in most school districts. If you haven't yeah. read it, just go read it. It's great. Um, or watch the movie with Gregory Peck. Beautiful film. Um, but it's interesting because that book does talk about rape. It does talk about violence. It does talk about abuse. It talks about death a ton. And it talks about our legal system, how complicated it is and how biased it is. It has all those big parts that I think are common in the books that are challenged. But it's funny what you're saying, Kristen, that like it's still a beloved book. Even though mm -hmm. if you did compare it to the books that are being challenged, I'm sure, you know, without the nostalgia, it would be just as offensive to some people. Um, yeah. And I think really what saves it is that it took place when... Mm -hmm bad racism was happening but not now you know like if yeah. you say racism yeah. is bad and you're saying it's now that's when they're going to start having a problem i feel like <sighs> i think you're yeah, probably yeah. right i think you're probably I right i think so too yeah because nicole as you were like listing off the things that to kill a mockingbird has I, I just recently finished the hate you give yeah and the hate you give checks those same boxes yeah mm -hmm. but it's because like kristen was saying it's contemporary and it ta and it's from a perspective of a black girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That it makes people feel like it has more to say that would make white people uncomfortable than To Kill a Mockingbird. It's so sad. Well, and uh, like I had mentioned to you guys earlier, but like within my school district, if I am to teach a book in a classroom setting, it has to be approved by a committee that is like half parents, half teachers. And it's like, it's like a group of six people and <laughs> they determine if this book is okay to teach in your school district and they have it by grade as well. So if I were to teach a book, I already know, like, I can't really get in trouble for this because it's been approved. So I kind of had that safety net, but also it like, I couldn't do teach a lot of books because they weren't on that list. And if I wanted it to be maybe um, eventually on the list, then I had to go through the whole process of like provide three books, give the reasons why this is important and why they should do it. And then you have to wait for the like biannual committee thing. So it's like this mm -hmm. whole process, right? But even if that didn't exist, I like a lot of the books that they're banning, like they, a lot of them are because it's about sexuality. Um, or like racism and stuff like that. But like, I wouldn't be teaching those books to my class, you know? Like, I have The Hate You Give. I have all these books in my classroom library that my kids have the freedom to read on their own. But like, there's no way I would have taught those to a group. Like, I want to keep my job, you know? So they're like, they have problems with so many of these books, but I'm like, these books, most of them that you're banning would never be taught in a classroom setting. <laughs> yeah because mm -hmm. like that's just asking for trouble like I will have it in my classroom but I tell it like on the syllabus when I give it out and the parents have to sign it I'm like I provide books just like a normal library and it's up to you to decide if it's okay with you or not like I'm not making you read any of these books like yeah. I just provide them and if you start reading it and you feel uncomfortable or you know your parents would not be happy with you reading it then put it down I'm not making you read it but like the books that I have my classroom read together, <laughs> I'm going with pretty safe options. And I think most yeah. teachers would want to, especially now. Yeah. I would never teach The Hate You Give. Like, and I think The Hate You Give is a great book, um, especially if you haven't read many books about social justice and all that stuff. But like, I wouldn't feel comfortable teaching that. Yeah, that's fair. That is 100% fair. It's wild because, yeah, it just, it tears down that, that argument that these teachers are just pushing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pushing. Because yeah. I'm the opposite. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you guys, yeah, you're I not just... afraid of losing your job ever. <laughs> right. And that's, and that's another thing is, like, I don't want to, like, take sides politically, but, like, one side is definitely, like, fear-mongering. Like, they're making parents scared, and they're telling these like stories that first of all I'm an educator and I haven't heard about them because it's so like there's always bad teachers out there that are doing inappropriate things like that is not okay but it's happening but like 
I think I should know about a lot of those because I'm an educator. But like I was asking my mom, I'm like, okay, so apparently a lot of these teachers are doing these bad things. Can you give me some examples? Because like I don't know what they're talking about and I'm a literal teacher. And so she gave me some examples and I'm like, okay, first of all, like I think one was about like helping trans kids get like testosterone or something. I'm like, um, first of all, like how? Oh, like, how is that yeah. happening? That, like, how do they have money for that? Are giving, I'm like, like, hormone blockers to kids. And I was like, they're not a doctor. There's no, so we many can't. other issues happening Oh, my here gosh. That are yeah, and I'm like, <sighs> yeah, there's so many. Or she, then she did give me an example. And apparently a teacher had, like, students, like, um, rewrite a story, but with, like, gay characters. And so I was like, okay, mom, think about this. Even if you're saying, like, I think you have, parents have a problem with this because it's it, if you're allowing them to write about someone that's gay, then that's saying gay is okay, first of all. So I think that's, like, the underlying message they have a problem with, but they can't really say that. But I'm like, okay, well, as an English teacher, I could do a similar exercise where I'm like, okay, we're going to rewrite Pride and Prejudice, but now the main character is a man. How would that change the story? Okay, now the character is black. How would that change the story? Now the person's gay. How would that change the story? You know? And I'm like, it doesn't. And she's like, oh, I'm like, yeah, but they're taking this example and they're making it seem like the teacher is pushing something on them. And I'm like, you can't push any beliefs on teenagers. Like it's not going to happen. (laughs) Um, And so I just, I really think they're just like trying to scare these parents with these like examples. And then like some of the examples, I'm just like, I don't know how that happened. That's not okay. But like, do you know how many thousands of teachers there are that are not doing that? Yes. <laughs> and you should have like how there are so many problems with the education system. And this is what you're focusing on. Like <laughs> it's such a waste. Yeah, there are so, so many problems and you're fighting books. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Oh, it just, it just makes me so upset. Cause I'm like, I know that you care about your kids, but if you cared about your kids, you would put your energy in the right place. And you're just clearly being manipulated to think that books and teachers are the problem. It's also interesting because if any teachers are getting away with pushing their beliefs, it's conservative teachers because they won't get in trouble. Cause oftentimes the parents agree with them, but I'm mm-hmm. like, like we, you can look around and you can be like, especially within Utah, you can determine a lot of people's political beliefs, whether they're an active LDS member or not. Um, and so first of all, that's like one sign to the students of like, are they LDS or are they not? And so, and if they're not, then like, but are they still this political party or this, you know, like teachers aren't telling them, but kids are smart. They can figure it out. Um, and like the more liberal teachers if they do anything out of line, they will get in trouble. Like they will get caught and they will get chastised and all these things. There are plenty of very uh, conservative teachers that were saying what they thought about things. Like for example, some kids wouldn't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and they'd be like, they'd give them like shit for it. And I'm like, uh, you can't do that. But because it's conservative and a lot of the parents would be like, yeah, they should stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. They can get away, get away with it, you know? And mm-hmm. it's, it's, yeah, the irony is not lost on me. So. Yeah. yeah. And I do think it's helpful to also see, like, why that liberals are also participating in book banning, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. for the other, yeah. for uh, uh, the other extreme. Like, mm-hmm. uh, we've got both sides going, but yeah. we're seeing most of the aggression in these conversations right now at this time 2023 i'm not saying historically always like this Mm -hmm. from the more conservative uh groups and i think like that speaks also to what we're banning because like you said most things that Mm -hmm. had to do with sexual orientation or identity also race and um yeah politics it's another big one yeah anything that has to do with race or identity yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. wild for teenagers who are going through all of those things. Mm-hmm. Like this is the time for them to read that stuff and not feel alone. And especially in Utah, I can only speak about this with Utah because I don't know the stats for every other state, but I know that the Mountain West has a massive problem with teen suicide. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, it's interesting the ways that we are going about this and also Utah specifically 
has, um, in, it's been in the zeitgeist. I'm not sure what the stats are, but it's been in the zeitgeist that there's a, that homeless youth is more of a problem than in other places. Like Salt Lake mm -hmm. City is kind of a hub for that. And a lot yeah. of the time it is kids that are not the stereotypical straight white kid. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of kids are disowned for their orientation or identity. And so when we do have these conversations, there are implications that happen when you ban books, when you say that this is an evil thing mm -hmm. to think about, even to mm -hmm. even read about. Um, that has that like has a massive echo, and I mm -hmm. don't think parents understand what that means. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like I like the parents that are sitting quietly. I don't know if we all understand. I think these this is like a call to action that like yeah, when one parent is going up there fighting against this thing, you don't want your kid to believe that that idea is evil. You you this is your moment to stand up against you know, to speak up as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like the wife in Field of Dreams. I think of her all the time. I don't remember her name. But she gets up there. Do you guys remember this movie? I don't remember the wife. I don't incredible know I've seen film. It. Incredible. Oh, I Jesus. love it. I love the film. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, um, there's like a point where they're banning a book in the community and um, the what how the wifey goes up and she's like super mad and she like is screaming mm -hmm. about it and it turns out that it's that author that has like the secret to like the field so then mm. um, whatever his name is the yellowstone dude goes back and like has to go figure that out and it's like james earl jones but um but like she's up there like fighting for this book and it is such a cool scene um and we just don't have that we've got the people doing the opposite we don't have the people yeah. fighting for these books. And that's where mm -hmm. we, we need to start standing up now. Mm -hmm. That is something that's happening with uh, just education in general within Utah, at least. I know it's happening other places, but there's like a few parents who get these other parents really riled up and like scared. Yeah. And like, I understand, mm -hmm. like you want your kids to be safe and like, yeah, I get that. Um, but they like get all these parents. And so they get a group and then they go and they come up with like a speech, but since you're only allotted so many minutes, they will just like read off parts of the speech. And so they just take over the whole meeting. And if there aren't any parents on the other side aware that this is gonna happen, then there's no one to fight them. And so it's just like they are, because like the parents on the other side, they're just like, I don't have a problem with what's going on. So they're not looking to voice their opinions yeah. for the parents that have a problem are then going to be there and then no one to fight on the other side. And so it's like a really just like it the the message that's like being shared at these like legislative meetings or just like the ones of the community are like not representing the actual community. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. these are these like handful of really upset parents and the rest don't care so they're not there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And yeah. so it's like, if you have a problem with something, then you're going to be there and everyone else who is the majority isn't going to be there. And then yeah. I'm just, oh, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it's not representative at all. So what we're saying is just people just need to get more involved. <laughs> Go fight for your books. Go fight mm -hmm. for them. Seriously. Yeah. They can't speak for themselves, even though they would if they were on the shelf. Our education system's kind of screwed. Like, we yeah. will agree with you on that. So, like, yeah. let's work on it together. Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, yeah. you're going to need us, and we're dropping, like, flies. And yeah. suddenly you're going to be like, oh, now we have to hire people that aren't educators to watch our kids. And then we're going to realize, oh, actually, they kind of did make a difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're actually trained. For this job, which is highly <laughs> yeah. because they're spending the majority of time with our child. Yeah. Yeah. They're actively choosing to be with kids instead of adults in the workplace. <laughs> and, and as much as we love your, your kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think I just like, I want parents to know, like most teachers have good intentions. At least from my perspective, we are terrified to be seen as a teacher that's indoctrinating your child. Yeah. Like, even if I could get away with it, I don't want to do that. I want them to think for themselves. Yeah. Um, if a kid can, like, write a paper that's, like, arguing um, a, 
a position that I don't agree with and it's well written, that is amazing. And I would love to read that because that may help me understand the situation or whatever better. Um, that's but we have to be, that means that we have to actually like allow them to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> and we're at the point where I'm like, no, nah, we're not going to do this topic. We're not going to do this topic. We're not going to do this one because it's just so con- controversial and like we're not above our own biases at this point. So it's, it's, we're screwed. And that's very, sorry, the cat's going crazy. Okay. But yeah, it's just like we're, we're like doing a disservice to ourselves. So yeah, because where mm-hmm. else can you talk about that stuff? And receive yeah. pushback. Like, where do you learn that critical thinking skill? That muscle is not being exercised at home, obviously. Um, yeah, oh my gosh, let the cat in. Um, oh, he let, yeah, he let the cat in. Get in. I don't have any other questions, comments, or concerns. Do you for Kristen? I don't. That was a very good conversation. Thank you, Kristen. Kristen, seriously, thank you birth. so much for your perspective. <laughs> And yeah. just, you're such an, you will forever be one of the most interesting people in, in my wow. zeitgeist. I don't even know if I use that word right. But we just <laughs> don't know how to use that word, so <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> Teacher of the year. Any, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything other? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Um, hmm. Why do you guys think To Kill a Mockingbird is, is banned often? <laughs> probably because of all the list of all the things you listed earlier nicole and then <laughs> i think the contemporary reason is for the white savior aspect yeah okay right, yeah because like before it was more like there's rape there's uh like racism but it's like it's as in like it's just mean <laughs> i guess <laughs> but yeah it was really just the stuff and like this is like intense stuff like it's real mm-hmm. conflict um, maybe this is too much for our kids to read. And now mm-hmm. a lot of times it's more like, yeah, there's a lot of other books that like tackle racism that won't have like the white guy being the savior yeah. or the, you know, um, or maybe we could focus on one that has more actual black characters and they aren't just some stereotype or something. Um, and so I think the reason it, it like, try it, it's, there's so many attempts to ban it and it depends on where you live and all those things. But like normally it just holds up just because so many people have read the book and Mm -hmm. because they actually read it. Unlike a lot of the people who try to ban books have never read the book. They're like, yeah, it's not problematic. Like maybe it's hard to talk about and there are difficult messages and things, but like ultimately if you actually read the book, like it is worthwhile. Yeah. And so I think because some people actually have read it, they're like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. In other words, yeah, a solution to a lot of this book banning is actually have the parent read the book and mm-hmm. understand it. Um, the, yeah. the one parent in the school district that's grumpy. Um, the reasons why <laughs> and, this yeah. book was banned is it start, the first banning was in um, the 70s, and it was because of the words damn and whore lady. And then it continues on <laughs> um, because oh it does psychological damage to the positive integration process and represents uh, institutionalized racism under the guise of good literature. That was by black parents, actually. And then mm-hmm. later on, it was banned because it contained profanity and racial slurs by white, and that was white parents. Actually, this book was banned a lot by different um, organizations of African American leadership. Um, specifically the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, thought it was unfit for junior high use. Um, but then, but most recently, and that was like in the 90s, but most recently it was banned because of the N-word. <laughs> and then one guy in New Jersey was like, it's, it depicts um, how African Americans are treated by members by a right, racist white community in Alabama. And this guy was worried that it would upset the African American children reading it. Yeah. So I guess he's just protecting that person was just protecting the children from knowing history, which is a sh- which, is, which is horrible. Our history is awful. Let's just get that straight. It is. Mm-hmm. It can be yeah. re-traumatizing for people who have experienced awful things mm-hmm. to learn that it's been happening for a long time, but. Also, we're bound to repeat it, it if we don't talk about it. Yeah. It yeah. would be interesting because, like, 
Well, first of all, like, yeah, we, I think you should read books that make you feel sad and uncomfortable, but it's like, yeah, are all the books that have black characters, like, a sad story? Because then that's not fair to the black kids. Like, they deserve to read something with a happy ending or hope. But, um, uh... I guess the the same can't be said for, like, white kids, where it's like, oh, it makes you feel sad. Well, like, you have so many other books that have happy endings, you know? <laughs> but um, I think... Oh, what was I saying? I don't remember. I guess that's a, that's a point that I have. No, it's, it's interesting. Just like, well, an interesting or thing just too. hearing, like, I haven't heard the perspective from a black person of what they think about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Because I've had, like, a hand... Like, we're in Utah. And even though I have taught at more diverse schools, it it tends to be more, like, Latino populations or Polynesians or something like that. Hardly any African-American students. So even when I do have them, obviously, I'm not going to ask them. (laughs) You know, I'm not going (laughs) to single them out because that's, like, a definite thing that I know not to do. But, like, yeah, yeah, like, a a lot of white people are going to be like, it's a great book. (laughs) And I'm like, do black people agree, you know? Mm Because, yeah, like, it's not making them the best person in it. And there's just a couple characters that are actually black and not happy time for them. What's also So I would would be interested. Huckleberry Finn wasn't... I didn't see any cases, and maybe we don't have every single case because it's banned all and challenged all the time. But um, by, um, like, organizations um, centered around African-American families... Whereas this book does have a lot more black parents that are complaining against it. Whereas, yeah, yeah I, Huckleberry Finn didn't... Whereas Huckleberry Finn, way more N-words. And, um, so many, yeah. So I don't know. So that's interesting. And maybe it is that Huck, Huck is a flawed character. And maybe it's also because it's also a Mark Twain book. was... Uh, <laughs> like, he wasn't the white savior that we all want... That Atticus, right, right. And also, Mark he Twain was, was a, a abolitionist as well, so yeah. that could be. And we don't really have a lot of evidence of Harper Lee being a huge civil rights. Maybe we do. I don't know, but I haven't really. Not till so like she came out with Go Tell and I Watch Men. So that's cool. Yeah. You know, you didn't like really see much besides that book. And yeah. then later on, you're like, oh, look how flawed Atticus is. I haven't even read it, but I just, I'm aware yeah. that, like, once, uh, what is her name? <laughs> Harper. No, the Scout. main character. Oh, my gosh. Scout. Yeah. Scout. Wow. Um, like, once she grows up, then she sees her dad for, like, a more realistic view. And it's like, oh, he actually is very flawed. Um, yeah. You don't really get that in To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Yeah. That's really true. But also, do we count that book because she didn't even know it was being published? I don't know. I haven't read it. <laughs> being published without her consent. So, I don't know. Yikes. I don't think we count it. I don't count it ethically. But It was, published, yeah. without, it was no. published without her consent? No. It was oh. published without her like consent. After. She did not know. That was supposed to be a first draft of To Kill a Mockingbird. And she has dementia. Very old lady. Living her life. And um, she, uh, yeah, it was published without her knowing. And she's, like, still not aware of its publication. But Wow. So yeah, it was, like, shady. the dealings of it are very shady of how it all went down. Yeah. It felt like a big money grab. So yeah, yeah, I wouldn't sure. want an unfinished work or a first draft of something published. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, so that's also yeah. why it's, like, I don't know. Um, one last thing about the banning is that a lot of people are claiming that this book promotes white supremacy and I don't think it's the lib I don't think that it's the perspective of like the nuance of white saviorism. Mm-hmm. I think it's people who genuinely haven't read the book. Because yeah. that's the thing cuz there's nothing nuanced about this complaint. It just says it has racial slurs, racial division and it's about a segregated community and therefore promotes white supremacy. So, and also there, it contains adult themes such as sexual intercourse, rape, and incest. And that was a um, middle school in Tennessee. So I like, to me, that doesn't say that that per- that says that that person actually hasn't read the book because yeah. then that means every book about segregation is promoting white supremacy. Yeah. So yeah. I it's think like they're, they're just tacking like, on They have more conservative, but they're like, I'm going to say this thing because that's what makes yes. liberals mad. So, like, well, yeah. and it's also promoting that, white supremacy, it it even though they're talking about how it's bad. 
Yeah, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it does feel like they just listed a complaint. Like, it started off with, like, sexual yeah. content, and then they just kind of listed, tacked on more and more complaints to give themselves a good enough case, you know? So, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, but it did win the 1961 Pulitzer Prize, so. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Harper. Um, love the book. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> love books. Very love them. We love books. We all love books. Um, well, thank you, Kristen. Kristen, if you yeah. ever want to come on again, please come on to our... But um, seriously, your perspective is so helpful because I think it is helpful for people to know it's not like all parents are evil and also that like you are afraid to teach openly. Like you're afraid <laughs> yeah. to teach what you're supposed to teach. And that yeah. is wild. That is like very troubling to hear that like... And mm. th- th- I know that's not the only reason why you left teaching, but I'm sure that didn't feel good to be on your on guard all the time. Yeah. It definitely, and it was growing, you know, like I've always been like, I'm aware, I'm like, I'm an English teacher, so I'm, you know, I'm walking a fine line, but it yeah. definitely like, just from teaching at Payson where I should have felt more unsure. Yeah. And then just within like five years, I was just like, I don't know about this book anymore. It was written by a BYU professor. Like that just shows, it really does feel different where I just yeah. feel like you can't talk about any type of political anything. Book is produced by us, Nicola Corin and Eden Wen. Music written by me, Nicola Corin, and produced and performed by my dad, Frank. <laughs>